The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. All right, we are back, everybody. Go ahead and have a seat if you would do that, please. And let's open our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24. 2 Kings 6, verse 24. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our study this morning. Father, we look to you now to just bless your word. And we're so thankful that you pour out the spirit of your word, Lord, that you would give us your heart, that we understand you would transform us this morning. And so we look to you, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the events of our study take place, of course, in the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, the prophet uh, at the time is Elisha. God has been demonstrating that he is moving in power in and through Elisha. Now, what's interesting is this. While God is demonstrating his power through Elisha, the kingdom in the north is very dark. In other words, the moral condition of things is very, very dark. So this is an interesting thing. Who you have, the moral conditions, so dark, so depraved. And, you know, Ahab had been king not long before this, and he was just the darkest and most wickedest king that they had had. And they had gone after the Moloch, they had gone after the Ashtoreth, they had gone after Tremosh. And so all of these false gods, you know, and all the debauchery and the, man, it was just turning into a mess. If you want a case study in how to see a country melt down, this would be it. And so while the moral conditions were dark, God was demonstrating his power. God was reaching out to them, wasn't he? God was demonstrating that he was still trying to get a hold of their heart. I mean, Chamash wasn't doing any miracles. Moloch wasn't doing any grand, powerful demonstrations of his heart and nature. And so what we saw was that God reaching out, continuing to reach out, reach out in his mercy. And so when we pick up the story here in 2 Kings 6, Israel finds himself uh, in a battle with Syria, nation of Aram. There had been constant conflicts with Aram sometimes. Israel would have the upper hand, sometimes Syria. When we get to this part of the story, Syria clearly has the upper hand. And they have even uh, besieged uh, Samaria, Samaria being the capital city of the north. Now, besieging a city was a very powerful uh, uh, tactic of war that was used to destroy a city, used to destroy a city without costing the lives of the soldiers. And so this was, if you could do it, I mean, if an army could do it, it was a powerful thing. Because without costing the lives of the soldiers, the city would be destroyed. Uh, excuse me, the people would be destroyed, yet the city would remain intact. And so it was like a neutron bomb sort of thing. It's like, wow, this was a very powerful thing to do. But if you're inside the city, it's, it's tragic. It's terrible. Famine and suffering and all. It was a condition that no city would ever want to find themselves in. So things had gotten so desperate in the city of Samaria, which we're going to read in just a moment, that a donkey's head would sell for 80 shekels of silver. Now this is a lot of money. I mean, they're paying a huge amount of money just to have a donkey's head, uh, you know, to eat. And so, you know, conditions are bad when you're, you know, wanting to actually eat a donkey, said, let alone pay for it, let alone pay 80 shekels. Now, you might wonder, is there anything actually good to eat in a donkey's head? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, because in actuality, yes, there is. In fact, I remember when we were growing up, you know, we, we had a farm, and uh, we raised pigs and, and butchered them. And one of the things that I sadly discovered is that none of the animal is wasted. And so I could not believe my eyes when they presented one day head cheese. You are joking me. We're going to be eating head cheese? Oh, yeah, it's like meatloaf. Just eat it right up. 
When you get to the point where you're eating a donkey's head, things are bad, my friends. And 80 shekels to pay for it. You know what? It got worse because they paid for dove's dung. Two, let's read the story. Chapter 6, verse 24. It came about after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until the donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and a fourth of a cob of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Now, uh, what is a fourth of a cob? About two cups. So for two cups of dove's dung... It would cost you five shekels of silver. Now, I've eaten strange foods in many countries of the world, but I suggest to you that this isn't good in any place of the world. Dove's dung soup is just not a delicacy on anyone's menu. Amen? But things were getting still worse than that. And so here's what happened. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, so he's going to walking on the wall, he's kind of assessing the situation, you know, and he knows it's bad. He's walking up on the wall, and a woman cried out to him, saying this, Help! Help, O Lord, my king! And so he said, now notice his response, because his response blames God. He says, now look, if Jehovah doesn't help, from where will I help you? From the threshing floor? From a wine press? And nothing. If God doesn't help, and he's blaming God, well, why isn't God helping? This is the same king. This is the same people who turned their back on God a long time ago. Well, here's what happened. So the king then said to her, okay, what's the matter? What's wrong? And she answered and said this. Now, this woman here said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and then we'll eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And then I said to her on the next day, now give your son that we may eat him. But she's hidden her son. Now that's not right. The king can't believe his ears. And so verse 30 came about when the king heard the words of this woman and realized how tragic the situation became. That he tore his clothes. And now he was passing by on the wall so people could see. And it says the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth beneath his clothes. He was actually wearing a gunny sack underneath his clothes. Which you would think would indicate he was humble. But then you see that he wasn't because what happens next is important. He then said, may God, he's angry, may God do so to me and more so also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. I'm going to take the head of that prophet off. He's mad at God. He's mad at Elisha. And so here we see this condition. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question, how? How did things get this bad? And and I think that what we need to understand is that God had told them that things would get this bad when they turned their hearts away from Him. You see, they had decided they didn't want God in their lives. They turned their back on God. We don't want God in our eyes. We're going to go after Moloch. We're going to go after Chamash. We're going to go after all the things that give us free license, you know, to go off, go after all these things. We don't want God. He's very restrictive. But Moloch, he's very permissive. You know, we've got to go after Moloch and Chamash. We don't want God. So they left God a long time before that. So God removed his hand of protection from them. My friends, this is a very important lesson. You don't want to be, no one wants to be outside of God's hands. Don't remain. If you are outside of God's hand, don't remain there. Don't remain outside of God's hand. The scriptures give us the principles to understand. The way of the transgressor is hard. If a man decides, I'm going to walk, I'll go my own way. Okay, well, God's telling you right now what's going to happen. It's going to get hard. Your life's going to be very difficult here. They had turned their back on God long before. Long before they departed from God, so they were outside of that hand of protection. See, God tells us that his hand is a hand of protection. That he, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. That, that he encloses. That the, it's important to understand. So you look at the story and you see, well, what has happened here? What has happened is that they've turned their heart away from God for many, many years. And then when things get bad... uh, The king starts blaming God. 
instead of taking responsibility. So here's the great lesson for us. Let's start with taking responsibility rather than blaming, rather than getting angry. Say, if the Lord doesn't help, how am I going to help? Well, he's blaming God for not helping. Have you ever done that? God should be helping me the way I think he should be helping me. And then we get angry with God. Then when the king had heard how desperate things had gotten, he wanted Elisha's head. He's angry with Elisha. There's the problem right there. See, how many people do you know that get angry when what they should be is humble? That is an indication. That's one of those things that we should mark in our minds and kind of log so that we would observe this fact of human nature. That when somebody is getting angry, when what they should be is humble, it's an indication that they're pushing the blame, they're blame shifting, they're not taking responsibility. We live in a society that blames other people. I mean, it's getting fraught in our society. Frivolous lawsuits, right, are, are a part of that blaming society. We all know, of course, the famous example, uh, you know, of uh, that, the, the person who ordered coffee from McDonald's and then was surprised when the coffee was hot. And then, you know, it spilled and then, ah, uh, you know, and wanted to sue McDonald's. And so now everybody has to put a label on their coffee, you know, caution, coffee is hot. Glad thing you, I'm good thing you said that I didn't know coffee was hot. Or how about this one? This was an actual case. A person ordered a milkshake from McDonald's and placed the milkshake between his legs and was holding the milkshake with his legs. Are you with me on this? Then he reached over to grab a hamburger out of the bag, and when he did, he squeezed the milkshake which made it, of course, explode onto his lap. He was distracted and then hit the car in front of him. So he sued McDonald's for not having the lid on the milkshake better. You will be happy to know that that was thrown out as frivolous. <laughs> yes. See, how, how, this blaming thing. How old is the blaming thing? You know what? It is so old. You, you go all the way back to Adam and Eve. The very moment that Adam and Eve sinned, they started blaming. Remember what had happened? They had eaten of the tree, which God had told them not to eat. God came in the cool of the evening. Adam, you know, where are you, Adam? And then there was Adam. And, and he said, have you eaten? Why are you hiding? Have you eaten of the tree I told you not to eat? And in one fell swoop, Adam blamed his wife and God in one sentence. He said, it was that woman that you gave me. <laughs> it was a woman, and you gave her to me. You know, it's got to be your fault. So then he looked to the woman, and the woman blamed the serpent. It was the devil. The devil made me do it. That's always a good one. I mean, the serpent said it was okay. Must be all right. You know, blaming. You know, it, you, know you look at discontent in your marriage. Are you discontent in your marriage? You know whose fault that is? That's James Dobson's fault. Yeah. If James Dobson hadn't have told us how good marriage could be, I wouldn't be discontent with my marriage. It's got to be his fault. No, no, I know. It's actually God's fault because he wrote Proverbs 31. If I hadn't read in Proverbs 31 how good a woman could be, I wouldn't have been disappointed with the woman I have. <laughs> the truth is that God was the one who warned them. God was the one who told them, hey, you turn your back on God, that's going to be the problem. Deuteronomy 28, God warned them in advance. If they turned their back on God, they would find that the way of the transgressor is hard. God even told them in advance how bad it would get, that it would even reduce the nation even to the point of cannibalism, of eating their own children. How bad can things get in life? How ugly can things get in our lives if we're left to our own devices? If God doesn't save, if God doesn't intervene, if God doesn't get a hold of our lives, how bad is it going to get? I I've talked to many people who said, if God hadn't gotten a hold of me, I probably would have been dead. It was going the wrong way. It was going so bad in the wrong way that if God, God hadn't taken a hold of me, I, I, I would have died. How ugly can things get? The answer, you see, is that we need the hand of the Lord. 
We need the protection. We need to have the Lord surround us. We need His hand upon our lives. We need Him surrounding us. In fact, would you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139? One of my favorite psalms. Psalm 139, let's just read beginning in verse 1. This is such an encouragement. It says, O Lord, you have searched me. You have known me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path. And my lying down, and you are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. And even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Now, is that good or is that bad? The scripture then continues. You have enclosed me behind and before. In other words, you have surrounded me. And you then, it says, have laid your hand upon me. This is how he describes it. He says, this knowledge, such knowledge is too wonderful. This is wonderful news. This is great news. This is wonderful stuff. He says, it's so high, I cannot even attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? If I were to flee, he said, where can I flee from your presence? If I were to ascend to heaven, you're there. If I was to make my bed in Sheol, the place of the dead, behold, you are there. If I were to take the wings of the dawn, if I were to dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lay hold of me, will lead me. Uh, this is an encouragement. This is what we need. Don't, don't, don't ever think for one moment that you're going to be just fine outside of God's hand. No, you need, we all need, Lord, surround me, enclose me behind and before. You surround me. I love this verse. You surround me with songs of deliverance. The great understanding. Now, let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 6. So, picking up our story, the king is furious with Elisha. He's going to go take his head off. Verse 32. Elisha now was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Now, here's a picture that's quite different. There's in the same city, but there's peace. Just waiting on God. Elisha also is suffering, waiting on God. They're sitting, the elders and Elisha. But the king had sent a man from his presence, and before the messenger came to him, Elisha said to the elders, Do you see? Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? Now look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door against him. In other words, pin him with the door. It is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. I want to talk to that man. So while he was still talking with them, behold, the messenger came down to him, and this is what the king said. Behold, this evil, God did it. This is Jehovah's doing. Jehovah is behind this. Why should I wait for God anymore? Why should I wait for the Lord? Now, is he blaming God here or what? Now, this is what Elisha said. Chapter 7, verse 1, you've got to hear God's response. Elisha then said this, listen to the word of Jehovah. Listen to the word of the Lord. Tomorrow at about this time, a measure of fine flour will be sold for one shekel. And two measures of barley will be sold for a shekel. And in the very gate of Samaria. In other words, six times the food for one-fifth the price. Now, there was a royal officer that was there, and he heard this thing. Apparently, he couldn't help himself because he had to interject. And he says, the royal officer, verse 2, on whose hand the king was leaning, answered the man of God, and he said this, behold. You just hear the scoffing, the mocking of the whole thing. Ah, now look. If Jehovah would make windows in the heaven, how could this thing be? I mean, if, if, if there were even windows in heaven, you're telling me this thing's going to turn around in one day? <laughs> right. Come on. If, if God were to open windows in heaven, how could this be? That is impossible. In his mind, he couldn't imagine how God could do it, therefore God couldn't do it. You see? I can't imagine how God can do it, therefore God can't do it. This is called lack of faith. He's scoffing was answered by this. So Elisha responded and said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but 
he won't taste of it. His unbelief is going to keep him from tasting of the promises of God. God's making an unbelievable promise. God's promising he's going to turn this thing around in one day. You're going to buy six times the food for one-fifth the price, and it's going to happen in one day. <laughs> Impossible. I don't see how God's going to do that. He said, you're going to see it, but you won't taste it. See, what does God want? God wants for us to take his promises and to take them to our heart, to believe them, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Unbelief is going to keep this man from tasting the promises of God. God is about to do a marvelous thing. He refused to believe it, and therefore he wouldn't taste of it. Would you turn in your Bibles to Luke 14? Because in Luke 14, there is a story, a parable really, that the Lord gives. Luke 14, beginning in verse 16. It's an interesting story. The parallel is marvelous for us to see. Luke 14, beginning in verse 16, Jesus said to him this. Now, there was a certain man who was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. Now, at the dinner hour, he sent a servant to say to those who had been invited, Come on now, everything is ready, dinner is ready, come on everybody, let's have our meal together. You've been invited, come on. Verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, uh, <clears throat> I have bought a piece of land, and uh, I, I really need to go out and look at it. Could you, could you just excuse me? Could you please just excuse me? Another one said, well, I bought five yoke of oxen, and i got to go try them out. Could you consider me excused, please? And then another one said, you know what? I, I married a wife, and I can't come to your dinner. So the servant came back, and he reported this to the master. Then the head of the household became angry when he heard this. And he said to the servant, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Interesting, isn't it? You see what he said? They won't taste of it. Go out there and bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So they did it. Then the servant came back and said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, but there is still room. And the master said to the slave, Well, go out into the highways and the hedge groves and compel them to come in, that my house may be full or filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Excuses all. See, there are some who look on with their eyes and they won't partake. Do you know what I'm saying? There are some people who, who, for some reason, they withhold their heart. They don't believe or they don't give God all of their heart. They hold back. They're, they watch. They watch. They, they, in fact, they enjoy seeing other people fully partaking, but for some reason, they don't taste of it. They will hold themselves back. Now, there's a tragedy. There is a great tragedy there. God wants you to partake, man. God wants you to... Eat fully, taste and see, enjoy, have the promises of God. What does it say? Paul wrote, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Paul wrote and said, For as many as are the promises of God in him, in Jesus, they are yes and amen. You know what he's saying? In Jesus, the promises of God are yes, yes, and amen. Enjoy them. He's saying, hey, I want you to taste them. I want you to have them. In Jesus, they're yes, man. They're amen. Do it. Have enjoy. He's given them to you. And then some people hold back and say, no. No, I'll, I'll just watch. But see, I love Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Eat, taste, and see the Lord is good. How blessed is, is, how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. How about Psalm 119, 103? How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Lord, I love the taste of your words. They are blessing to my heart. They are good to my soul. Lord, you make me alive. Lord, I love the word that you pour into my life. Oh, God, thank you. I taste, I enjoy. The promises of God are yes. Oh God, I love them. Other people are holding back. You know what God is saying? God is saying, I want you to feast on the promises. Taste, enjoy, feast on the promises. 
See, what had happened was this. Israel is out of options. Israel, out of options. Situation, beyond desperate. But they had taken God out of the equation. God wasn't out of options. They were hearing now a blessing, a promise. God's going to turn this around in one day. See, God was going to give his mercy. That's why Elisha was there. To demonstrate the mercy of the Lord in spite of their lack of belief and turning their back on God, God was still demonstrating. Do you not know what the scripture says in the book of Romans that it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance? How? How was God going to do it? Well, the story continues. There were four lepers outside of the city. And so these four lepers, now remember, leprosy is a picture of sin. These leprosy is a picture of sin because, of course, they're outcasts, they're diseased, they're terminal. It's a great picture of, uh, for us of sin. And so it tells us that, verse 3, there were four leprous men out at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? What are we doing? If we say we will enter the city, well, there's famine in the city and we'll die there. If we just sit here, we're going to die. So therefore, let's go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we live. But if they kill us, we're going to die anyway. Here's what they're saying. Let's throw ourselves on mercy, shall we? If we go into the city, they're just dying in there. If we stay here, we're dying here. How about this? Why don't we throw ourselves on the mercy? Because there is hope. And if you think about it, leprosy being a picture of sin, those three options are really still available today, aren't they? The one option, I mean, if you look at the world and you see the, the famine, the suffering, you see, spiritually speaking, the world is lost. That there are really three choices, aren't there? Hey, let's go, let's go in the city. Let's go join everybody else who's dying. Or you can say, let's do nothing at all. Let's just see that I'm going to die anyway. Or you can throw yourself on mercy, for there is hope. So this is what happened. So, verse 5, they arose at twilight to go out to the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, no one was there. Here's what happened. The Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and the sound of horses, even the sound of a great army. So that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come against us. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp, just as it was, and they fled for their life. So when these uh, lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent, and there must have been dinner time because all the food was right there. They ate and they drank and they, they found gold and silver and some clothes, and they went out and they hid those things. They went into another camp, and they ate some more and got some more silver and some more gold and hid that stuff. Like, woo, this is amazing. They're just, they're starving in the city, but look at this, man. I mean, there's Mediterranean chicken. There's vegetable galore, you know. There's all kinds of desserts all laid out there, wine and all, everything's all before them. But what had happened is an interesting story. For what God had done, he had done something in their hearing. You know, it's an interesting thing. God had caused them to hear the horses and the chariots in the army of the Lord. Last week we were studying about Elisha. And when the king of Aram uh, wanted to get Elisha, he sent a, a, a little band of soldiers to, uh, not a little band, but he surrounded the city of Dothan where Elisha was. And so Elisha's servant gets up in the morning, you know, maybe makes some coffee, and he looks out there. Whoa, he says, the, 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 the Syrian soldiers are surrounding the city. And he called out to Elisha, Master, what do we do? Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes. So Elisha's servant spiritually was able to see what he had not seen before. For he said, Behold, the hills were filled with horses and chariots of fire. He is the captain of the host of the army of heaven. And so what he saw before them was this. Elisha then explained and said, Greater are they who are with us than they are who with them. 
And so the spiritual realm was revealed, and so the confidence that Elisha's servant therefore then took because he saw the revealing of the army of heaven. But here, the same army is revealed in their hearing. Be careful how you listen is an interesting insight that Jesus gives to us. Be careful how you listen. See, what you tune your heart to, where you turn your heart, is therefore where you're going to tune your ears. In Luke chapter 8, verse 18, this is Jesus speaking, and he said, So take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he does or what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. Be careful how you listen. What is your heart turned? Jesus said of the Pharisees, you can't hear. You can't hear because of your father, the devil. Be careful how you listen. When, when Israel heard the taunts of Goliath, they heard one thing. They heard the sound of intimidation. They heard the sound of a man that caused fear. David heard something very different. Same words, different heart. When David came upon the scene and he heard the taunts of Goliath, he became enraged. Do you hear? Do you hear what this uncircumcised Philistine is saying? Who taunts the living God of the nation of Israel? Does he not know there's a God over his... You've got to love David. He heard something very different. Do you hear what this man is saying? He heard a very different thing. When Jesus was speaking to the churches in Revelation... Seven times he said the same thing, and it means this. Be careful how you listen. This is an example. Revelation 2, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Paul said something similar to the church at Rome, and it means this. Be careful how you listen. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Be careful how. Where is your heart turned? That's where your ears will be tuned. So this is what happened. So here are these lepers. They're in the camp. You know, they're eating. They're drinking. They're carrying away gold. They're hiding it, you know, and burying it. And so they, they continued on with this. And finally, verse 9, they said it to one another. Now, wait. This isn't right. What we're doing here, this isn't right. This day is a day of good news, and we're keeping silent about it. This isn't right. This is, a, this is a day of good news. They are starving. There's famine just over that wall. And here we are eating and drinking and enjoying these promises that God had provided. And we're just saving them for ourselves. You know what? This isn't right. Now, this is a great verse that compels us and gives us an insight into why we should be sharing our faith. Because this is a day that the Lord has made. This is a great day. This is good news. God has taken us who were broken, and, and, and we were suffering. There was famine in the land spiritually, and God answered. And we enjoyed. We saw the healing of the Lord. God's touched our lives. God is transforming right now. Right now, in this very room, God is changing. God is transforming. We are enjoying. We are tasting of the Lord. We're seeing His transforming power. His Holy Spirit is moving in the church even now. We are enjoying the fruits of the Lord. We're enjoying the fruit of God, the blessings of his, of his hand being poured out upon us as we're seeing transformed. Those who were once you know, addicted to drugs are being changed. Marriages are being restored. Life is being changed. God is doing things that are transforming in power. This is good news. And yet you look out there just across that wall. There's famine. There's suffering. People dying. This world going. And we got good news. And see, here's the thing. Let others know. Let others know the good news. We too know there's good news that transforms. God takes the broken and brings healing and hope. You know what's interesting? As soon as someone hears, you, you know, we ought to be sharing our faith. You know what people immediately, how they respond immediately? Now, pastor, you don't understand something. They don't want to hear they don't want to hear. You talk to those people. I've tried that. I've tried that. You talk to those people out there. You know what they do? They say, no, thank you. I don't need whatever you're selling. I don't need it, okay? Have you ever met anyone like that? See, what's interesting is that there's two kinds of people. There's really two kinds of people. 
There are those who know that they're sick and hurting and great famine and suffering, and they know they need help. So when you talk to them and you say, do you know that God transforms and that God heals and that God saves and that God can take your life out of that miry clay, that pit in which you're living, and God can take you and he can put you on a rock? Did you know that? And they're going to say, oh, thank you. Show me the way. Teach me. Help me. Pray with me. What can I do? And you can lead, you know, give them the, the, the great news and they're welcoming it because they see their great need. But there are others who don't know. I don't need, I don't know. I don't need it. You know, this is interesting because it happened to Jesus also. Jesus, he was eating with sinners and tax gatherers. They're the despicable part of the society, right? And here's Jesus. He's eating with sinners. Can you imagine Jesus eating with sinners? And the Pharisees, the leaders of the day, looked at that and said, who does he think he is? Eating with sinners. That is despicable. Well, Jesus, when he heard this, this is Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician. It's those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners. There are many people who, who say, you know what? I got everything I need. I'm good. I'm okay. You know, I don't need whatever it is you're selling, whatever it is you're trying to buy. I don't need it. Okay. I'm good. I, I'm fine, really. I'm fine. You know, it's interesting, because in Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 to 18, Jesus actually responded to that, and this is how Jesus said, he said, because you say, I'm rich, I have need of nothing, I don't need anything, I'm good, but you don't know that you're miserable and wretched and poor and blind and naked. I advise you. To buy from me gold, he said, refined by fire. And he continues on. I advise you to buy from me eye salve to anoint your eyes that you might see it. Because there are plenty of people. You want to tell them, there's good news, man. There's eternal hope, man. You know, I don't need that. Really? You don't need that? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you stand before the Father? What are you going to do when you stand before your Creator and give an account for your life? What are you going to say? Well, I was good. No, you weren't good. There is none righteous. No, not one. And so therefore, you see, what we need to understand is that what they did was right. we got to share this good news. We can't keep this to ourselves. There are people who are suffering. There are people who are hurting. Does anybody here know any sinners? They're suffering and hurting, and then the good news is the answer. So this is what happened. They came, verse 10, and they called to the gatekeepers of the city, and they told them, saying, Now we came to the camp of the Arameans, and there was no one there, nor the voice of a man, only horses tied and donkeys tied in the tents, just as they were. So the gatekeepers called, and then they told this to the king's household. This was during the night. So the king arose in the night, and he said to his servants, I will tell you now what the Arameans are doing to us. Let me explain this to you. They know that we're hungry. Therefore, they've gone away from the camp and hidden themselves in the field, saying, now, when they come out of the city, we're going to capture them alive and get into the city. You wouldn't believe it. This is impossible. I'm not going to believe it. Unbelief. Is that a classic example of unbelief? So one of the servants, verse 13, answered and said, please, please, let some men take five of the horses which remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they will be in any case like the multitude of Israel who are left in it. Then he repeats it and he says, Behold, they will be in any case like all the multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let's send and see. So they therefore took two chariots with horses, and the king sent after the army of the Arameans, saying, Okay, go and see. So they went after them to the Jordan, and behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment, which the Arameans had thrown away in haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Notice this. So the people went out, 
and plundered the camp of the Arameans. And then a measure of fine flour was sold for one shekel, and two measures of barley was sold for one shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Here's the question. We'll end with this. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? When the king heard the good news, he wouldn't believe it. Thought it was a trick. See, unbelief will keep you from enjoying. I don't believe it. Keep you from enjoying the promises of God. How many people do not take God at his word and therefore they don't have the promises? I don't see, I I can't imagine how God's going to do it. Therefore, I don't think he will. But is anything too difficult for the Lord? Are you out of options? You're out of op- God's not out of options. I love Jeremiah 32, verse 17. This is such a powerful verse. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God. He declares, ah, Lord God. Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. I learned that in the King James. It just says, it sounds more powerful in the King James. Ah, Lord God. Behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing is too difficult. Just because you can't imagine how God might answer doesn't mean that God's out of options. Is anything too difficult? We don't have. What does it say in James chapter 4 verse 2? You don't have because you don't ask. But ask, believing For the one who asks and does not believe is a double-minded man. Let not that man think he will have anything from the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. For you revealed to us such important insights. Lord, we don't want to be outside of your hand. Enclose us. Enclose us behind and before. Lord, help us to taste and see that you're good. Church, this morning, this day, when we're praying together, I keep praying, and I want to ask this question. Are you one who has withheld your heart? You look on as others taste, but you don't yourself give God your heart? You look on with your eyes, but you don't taste. You know what God is calling you to do? God is saying, would you enjoy the blessings? For the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. And they're for you. And he's offering it. Eat, taste. The word of the Lord is good. It's sweet to the mouth. It's sweet to the soul. Enjoy. Why do you withhold? If you're here today and you would say to the Lord, I will withhold my heart no more. God, I'm giving you my heart. I'm going to taste fully of the promises of God. I'm going to give you my heart. I've been watching as others partake. I'm going to partake. I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to taste fully and enjoy the sweetness of who you are. Would you say that to the Lord? Just lift up your hand to him. Just say that in all boldness. Lord, this is my desire. This is what I'm saying to you today. I want to give you my heart And I want to taste and enjoy all the fullness of who you are. Just say that to the Lord if you would. Just raise your hand in boldness and say that to God. Lord, this is my heart. That's my desire. This This is where I come to you, Lord, and ask that you would bless. You know what? The Lord is delighting when you say that. The Lord wants to bless in his Holy Spirit. He wants a relationship where we are fully his, fully devoted, and enjoying the blessings of his hand. Father, we love you and thank you, for, thank you for pouring out life. We receive that life today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503 642 2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org 
On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, may God bless you.